In the early part of the 20th century, the editor of the London Times asked his readers to write in their response to a particular question. And he promised that he would publish their responses. And here's the question. What's wrong with the world today? G.K. Chesterton, author, Christian layperson, and a superb theologian, wrote this, and it was published by the Times. Dear Sir, I am yours, G.K. Chesterton. (laughs) Isn't that a great answer? Chesterton understands what the Apostle Paul has been meticulously laying out for you and me in chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Romans. That the sinful human condition has created a, a, a situation of unrighteousness, being out of right relationship with God. It affects and infects the whole human race without exception, Jew, Gentile alike. And on top of that, there's absolutely nothing humanity can do, nothing you and I can do as fallen human beings to extract ourselves from this dilemma of sin, this dilemma of unrighteousness, being out of right relationship with God. That unrighteousness has messed up the world. That unrighteousness must be held accountable before the bar of God's justice. The whole creation has been affected by the human sinful condition. I mean, look at our own land. In 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation was implemented And 152 years later, and even after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the sin of racial prejudice is just as alive today in our country as it ever was. And then what about the war on poverty? Remember that? That started in 1964. Uh, 51 years and $22 trillion later, what's the situation? 45 million Americans still live in abject poverty. In 1971, the war on drugs was launched. How'd that work? Well, in America today, on a yearly basis, we've been spending, by the way, about $51 billion a year to combat drugs. Drug abuse accounts for about $700 billion dollars uh, of pulling down the American economy. Get this, 47% of Americans above age 12 admit to illegal drug use. Do you see what's going on here, my friends? Human efforts cannot change human hearts. That's the bad news that the Apostle Paul has been laying out in the first three chapters of Romans. That's the bad news. We've met the enemy, and the enemy is us. The Roman poet Horace um, has some, he wrote some guidelines for playwrights back in his day. His cardinal rule is this. Do not bring a god onto the stage unless the problem is one that deserves a god to solve it. Well, that's what we're going to see the Apostle Paul do right now. He's been laying out all this bad, bad news over chapters 1, through 2, through 2, and 3. But now, in verse 21 of chapter 3, the mood swings all the way from bad news to good news. Some people say that Romans 3, verses 21 through 26 is the greatest gospel paragraph in all of Scripture. Is it? Let's take a look. Turn with me in your Bibles and keep them open to Romans 3 as we look at verses 21 through 26. But I invite you to pray with me before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives For Jesus' sake. Amen. And now hear God's word directed to you and me this morning, beginning to read at verse 21 of Romans chapter 3. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested 
apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance, he passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, May they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. What would you say is the greatest and the most gracious word in all of the Bible? Well, I cast my vote for the first word in verse 21 of our text, that little word, but. Human sinful unrighteousness has messed up the entire world. Human sinful unrighteousness has revealed that the bar of God's justice is so high that none of us can jump it. Human sinful unrighteousness has revealed to you and me that the chasm created between us and God, created by our sin, is a chasm that's too wide. We cannot get across it. Human sinful unrighteousness shows you and me basically that that we're toast. That, well, Kemosabe, I guess we're all done for. Be you Billy Graham or Billy the Kid. we're, We're trapped in this sinful dilemma. And then along comes this little word, but, a word of hope. A word of promise, a word that reminds you and me that our sinful situation will never, never, never have the last word in our lives. So let the good news roll. In verse 21, Paul says the good good news of the gospel is that even in our sinful condition, being put right into a relationship with God to be restored is a possibility. In verse 21 of our text, Paul says the good news of the gospel is that you and I being restored into a right relationship with God has nothing, nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with the law. You know, keeping the law, being good little boys and girls, buying into that superstitious myth that, well, maybe my good deeds can outweigh my bad deeds. Paul says the law has nothing to do with it, although he says in verse 21, the law and the prophets do bear witness to what the solution is. And then in verse 22, Paul puts a name to the solution. He says the good news of the gospel of grace has a name. It's the name of a savior, the name of a rescuer, and that name is Jesus. And Paul says, That name and that name alone is the only way out of that sinful dilemma. No other name but the name of Jesus. And then he says that that name is more than just a name. It's not a concept. That you and I are restored back into right relationship with God through faith in that name name, in the name of Jesus, in the person of Jesus Christ, which begs the question, what is faith? Well, my friends, faith is nothing less than a personal relationship with the living Lord Jesus Christ. Do you and I have that relationship with Christ? If you don't, please call me and come and talk with me sometime. 
And then in verse 23, Paul says, the good news of the gospel, in so many words, is that God does not grade on the curve. That you and I don't have to sit around worrying about, well, maybe there's somebody out there living better lives than I am. That's going to make me look bad in comparison, and I'm going to be sunk. No, Paul says, we're all sunk. We're all sunk. Please memorize Romans 3.23. That will help you and me get rid of any of that spiritual pride that might make us think that we just might have a leg up on somebody else because in the world's eyes, we look like pretty good people. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No exceptions. We're all in the same boat. Adolf Hitler, you Me, Jack the Ripper, we're all in the same boat. And then Paul goes on in verse 24 to say the good news, the good news of the gospel is that the solution comes to you and me as a gift, a gift that God has slipped under our Christmas tree, the ultimate gift of gifts. You know, Jesus literally was born into this world, came into time and space, to do for you and me what we cannot do for ourselves. That's God's gift to you and me. A gift always comes to you and me from outside of ourselves. And in in this case, Paul is saying in verse 24, we don't deserve this gift. And so he talks about grace. Grace is you and me getting what we don't deserve. Praise be to God. But what's the result of this gift? Well, Paul goes on to, in verse 24, to say it's nothing less than our redemption from the sin predicament. Well, that's a nice word, redemption. But what does it mean? A Bible translator was translating the New Testament into the heart language of a fairly remote West African tribe. He spent his first couple of years on the field learning their language while also teaching them, and chiefly the tribal chief, English. Because his plan was, as he would translate verses of Scripture, he'd take it to the tribal chief and run it by him. Is this saying uh, in your language what it's saying in English? And he's translating Romans, and he hits verse 24 of our text, and he's trying to figure out what's the native word for redemption. And he can't come up with one, so he goes to the tribal chief and he says, what in your language would be the equivalent of this English word redemption? And the chief said, you know, I'm not really sure what that even means. And so the translator is trying to explain to him how Christ's death on the cross figured out into all this. And the chief finally said, well, I, I don't think we have a word for that. Well, a few days later, the chief all excitedly comes to the translator and says, I got it, I got it. Not a word, but a phrase. The translator said, okay, what is it? Take your head out. (laughs) Take your head out, the translator asked. Oh, you see, 150 years ago, the slave traders would come. They would raid our village. They would take away our strongest, most virile young men. They would put slave collars around their necks collars that were attached by a chain to other slave collars, and then they would march them through the jungle, chained to each other with those slave collars to the slave ship that was waiting at the coast. But if you were a father and you loved your son and you had enough gold or jewels or money, you would chase after the slave traders. You would plead with them to release your son. And if you had enough money had enough gold, had enough jewels, then the slave trader would unlock that slave collar and take the young man's head out. And that young man would be free. My friends, that's what the gift does for you and me. Christ has taken our head out of slavery to sin, taken us off that ultimate journey to where sin would want to take you and me. 
Now, a gift only achieves the purpose of the giver when that gift is received and accepted and embraced. Have you, have you, have I accepted the gift? Is your head in or out? Here at this table this morning, you and I come face to face with tangible and tasteable evidence of our redemption in Jesus Christ. In verse 25 of our text, Paul goes on to say that this redemption comes only through the propitiatory sacrifice of Jesus' blood. Verse 25 is pointing to the cross. The Old Testament sacrificial system pointed to the fact that there had to be some ultimate, once for all, sufficient, perfect sacrifice to deal finally with the dilemma of human sin. And Paul says that has happened in the cross of Christ. But in verse 25, he also uses the phrase, phrase passed over. That in his forbearance, God passed over former sins. Now, is that phrase passed over there by accident or by intention? Well, what's the greatest, the greatest event in the Old Testament? The Exodus. The Exodus, when God, through Moses, takes the head of the nation of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. And how was that exodus initiated? Well, the night before they left, God said to the Hebrews, sacrifice lambs. Put the the blood on the doorposts of your homes. Because that night, the angel of death is going to pass over the nation of Egypt. And if he sees the blood on your doorpost, he will pass over your house and everyone will be spared. In Romans, we've already seen that baptism is the New Testament counterpart to Old Testament circumcision. The Lord's Supper, Holy Communion, the Eucharist is the New Testament counterpart to Old Testament Passover. That feast, the Passover that the Jews have been celebrating for millennia, marking the Exodus. Christ, on the night before his crucifixion, celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples, but there on that evening he transformed it into the sacrament that you and I partake of this morning. At the Lord's table, we come to the heart and soul, the apex of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Here at the Lord's table, you and I come as close to the real presence of Christ that we can come in this life, this side of eternity. When you and I come to this table this morning, we come face to face with our redemption. Redemption that has a name. The name of Jesus. And as we come to this table, Paul reminds us in verse 26 that we also come face to face with the fact that God is a just God, but also the justifier at the same time. What Paul is saying is this, that God's justice is perfect. There's not one tiny sin in the world that will not be held accountable and must be paid for. And yet we can't do that. But God himself steps forward, becomes the justifier through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus takes your penalty, mine, upon himself. It's his blood that he places on the doorposts of our house. And so any condemnation of our sin, that passes over us. 
and has been taken into the very body of Christ himself. The price has been fully paid. God's justice has been completely satisfied. And so when we come to this table this morning, here we find God's perfect justice coming together with our gracious justification. Through the one who is the Passover lamb, sacrificed for our redemption now and for eternity. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.